Today we're talking about something a little spicy. So we're going to take a look at five cursed Sudoku variants, starting from lightly cursed and going all the way through to what is, in my opinion, the most cursed Sudoku variant of all time. So buckle in and get ready to question my taste in the comments because it is time for some weird Sudoku history with Clover. Let's start with the least cursed variant on my list. This is actually two variants. They're called surplus Sudoku and deficit Sudoku. And right now what you're looking at is a surplus Sudoku by the setter Sam Kappelman lines. Each region in this puzzle contains each digit at least one time. But it's also possible that it could contain any digit more than once. Normal rules still apply for the rows and for the columns, but the region logic is out the window. Now you're looking at a deficit Sudoku by Cliff the Crafter. And in deficit Sudoku, the opposite is true. Each region contains each digit at most once, but regions can be missing one or more digits. So we can't have, for instance, a second nine in this cell since we already have a nine here. But we don't know, for instance, that we have to have a 1 in this region. It's possible that 1 is simply missing entirely. So you're probably wondering what makes these innocent-looking variants cursed. If we look at the very foundational stuff of Sudoku, we often conceptualize that logic as falling into two categories, naked and hidden. Naked logic is the logic where you ask questions like, if I look at this specific cell, which digits are allowed to go into it? And if there's only one digit that can go into a cell, we call that cell a naked single. For instance, here in the setup, we have a cell in the 6x6 Sudoku that already sees 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That eliminates those five options from that cell, and so we call this a naked one. You can imagine the different options for the cell as being like the clothes that the cell is wearing, and we're taking them all away except one to make that cell naked. The other type of foundational logic is hidden logic. It's the type of logic where you ask the question, here's a digit, where am I allowed to put that digit? In this setup, there's only one place in this region where one can go, because this one sees these cells, this one sees these cells, and there's already a six here. So the one can only go there, and we call that a hidden one. The one only has one place in the region remaining where it can hide. We eliminate possible spots for it, we're getting rid of its hiding places, and when it's in its last spot, it is a hidden one. In surplus Sudoku, we're actually taking away your ability to use one of those two types of logic, naked logic, in a region. So if this was a normal Sudoku, you would be able to look at this cell and say, I have a 6 and a 7 in the row, I have a 2 and a 5 in the column, and I have a 1 and a 3 elsewhere in the region. Therefore, this cell must be the only remaining possible digit, which is a 4. That's not true. We simply are not allowed to do that. We can't eliminate the 1 and 3 just because they appear in the region already. We have to mark it as a 4 or a 1 or a 3. Deficit Sudoku is just as cursed, but in the opposite direction. Instead of taking away naked Sudoku logic, we're taking away hidden logic. So take a look at 6 in this region. So if this is a normal Sudoku, we could say 6 can't go here or here. 6 can't go here. Therefore, 6 must go here. But we actually can't do that in this puzzle, because it's also equally possible that there's just no 6 in this region at all. And that is why these variants made the cursed list. They're at the bottom of the list, they're not the most cursed variants, but there's something to the fact that we get so used to using these two types of logic that we don't even have to think about which one we're using. We just naturally ask ourselves questions like which digit could go here and where could this digit go? And when you suddenly have to solve a puzzle that looks normal, but where the foundational logic of Sudoku just stops working, it's inevitably going to feel a little bit cursed. Deficit Sudoku was actually invented before surplus Sudoku. It was developed by Wei Hua Huang, he is an American puzzle and game designer who's been active in the Sudoku community for many, many years. I read about this variant on Grandmaster Puzzles, which is a long-running puzzle blog and publishing house founded by Thomas Snyder, who is also a fixture of the Sudoku community. And this blog is absolutely a wealth of information about the history of different puzzle types. And according to Grandmaster Puzzles, Weihua originally called this variant Udoku, as in Sudoku with a missing letter. And the GM Puzzles article goes on to explain that Deficit Sudoku was created for the Second World Sudoku Championship in Prague in 2007, 
and that discussions between Weihua and Thomas Snyder led to the development of its counterpart, surplus Sudoku, shortly thereafter. Deficit and surplus Sudoku have become a staple specifically of the UK Sudoku Championship, which is where I first encountered them a couple of years ago. Now let's go on to a variant that is slightly more cursed, number four on our list. Uh, so this is greater than Sudoku. I first saw this variant on the website Sudoku Maniacs by Rishi Puri, where it is presented like this. All of your normal Sudoku solving techniques work perfectly well here. So normal Sudoku rules apply, and then we also have some inequality signs in the grid that work just like ordinary inequality signs. The open end of the inequality points to the bigger of the two digits surrounding it. This variant is notorious for making it incredibly difficult to identify which parts of the grid are meaningful and which ones won't give you any useful information. And I think one thing that makes it so hard is that it's just visually overwhelming. It's a lot harder to tell the difference between a string of inequality signs that are all pointing in the same direction and a string of inequality signs that's all mixed up compared to telling the difference at a glance between the digit one and the digit seven. The other thing is that any individual inequality sign doesn't give you a lot of information by itself. Knowing that one cell is greater than one other cell barely narrows things down at all. There are essentially two ways to approach this type of puzzle. So one option is to start by restricting either very low digits or very high digits. If there is a one in a cell, all of the inequality signs surrounding that cell will have to have their pointy end towards the one. Vice versa, if there's a nine in a cell, all of the open ends of the inequality surrounding it will have to point towards that cell. For instance, this box, and this is kind of an artificial example that I just set up to demonstrate this, but if you scan through this, there is only one cell where all of the inequality symbols are pointing in towards it, and therefore that's the only position where we can possibly place a one. And then once you've done that, you move on towards placing twos, threes, etc. And if you get a little stuck, you can go reverse and start by placing nines and then eights and then sevens and so on. And hopefully you end up meeting in the middle without too much hassle. There is also the possibility of identifying lengthy strings of inequalities that all point in the same direction, similar to solving a thermo Sudoku. I find this more difficult, particularly before the grid is very restricted. But for instance, if you look at this bottom right region, if we kind of squint at it, we have this string of inequalities where this digit is smaller than this one, which is smaller than this, smaller than this, smaller than this, and smaller than this. So effectively, we have a thermometer going from here to here, and we can pencil mark these. And that can sometimes give you enough that you can start moving and kind of limiting digits a little bit further than you were able to previously. I find this easier to do once I've already restricted the grid a fair bit by placing low and high digits, but it's possible that you'll run into an inequality Sudoku where this is more viable from the beginning. This Sudoku variant is quite old, and I do not know for sure where it came from. It definitely appeared in the very first World Sudoku Championship in Italy in 2006, so it was likely known before then. And by the way, I want to share this particular presentation of it from the fifth World Sudoku Championship in the USA in 2010, because this, I think, is the most cursed possible presentation of Greater Than Sudoku. Somehow they have taken a Sudoku variant that's already visually challenging, and without changing the logic, this is still just inequality signs greater than or less than. They have made it even harder to scan. I suspect, but don't know for sure, that greater than Sudoku has its origins in another puzzle type called Futoshiki, which is essentially greater than Sudoku on a Latin square, which is to say greater than Sudoku, but without regions. This specific puzzle type was developed by Tamaki Seto in 2001, but I would be surprised if that was the first time inequality signs were used in a Latin square or Sudoku-like puzzle. It seems more likely that this is something that has been independently discovered many, many times, given how naturally it seems to go hand in hand with the presentation of Sudoku with digits. Now things are getting interesting. You're looking at a puzzle by Richard Stolk, created for his long-running Sudoku variant series. This is a variant called Parquet Sudoku, and it is our third most cursed Sudoku variant. Presumably it's called that because it looks like a parquet floor. I have also seen this called Tile Sudoku, and I'm guessing that's for the same reason. So in this Sudoku variant, we technically follow normal Sudoku rules to the letter, replacing the digits one through nine exactly once each in every row, every column, and every 
three by three region, every nine cell region. The catch though, is that in this variant, there are basically 16 rows and columns, and some of the cells are in more than one row or column simultaneously. That fact can make Parquet Sudoku both easier and harder, and I think that in most cases it does both at once. So what you're looking at now is a Parquet Sudoku that was in the Sudoku Mahabharat competition in 2022. It was in round four, which was authored by Neon Agarwal and James Peter, who are both very well known in the Sudoku community. The breakthrough for me with this puzzle type came from realizing that there are restrictions on how quote unquote tall or how wide the cells containing certain digits can be. So we have two sixes in these columns, and we need to make sure that there is also a six in each of these two quote unquote columns. But unless we want to put multiple sixes into this region together, we're only allowed to use one more six to do it. If we were to put our last six here, then we would be missing out on this third from the right column out of 16. So what we're forced to do is place a six in this region into a cell that's two columns wide. And there's only one of those that doesn't conflict with the ex existing sixes. It goes here. Now, if we take this six and combine it with this six, we've accounted for two of our rows. And so now we need to place a six in a region that is only, or in a cell that is only one column tall, or one row tall in this region. So the only remaining open option for that is to place a six here. Here are just two examples from Thomas Snyder and Wei Hua Huang's 2009 book, Mutant Sudoku. I've removed the given digits from these just because these are puzzles that you would ordinarily have to pay for. The takeaway is that there's a tremendous diversity of possible layouts for these grids. They all operate slightly differently, and in general, if you're solving one of these in the contest, it is not typically the norm for the grid layout that you see in the instruction booklet for the contest to be identical to the one in the actual contest. So if you want to succeed on one of these, if you want to solve it very quickly and efficiently, you need to be generally comfortable with identifying the geometric restrictions in the grid. You really have to be adaptable and have to be prepared to deal with anything. The second reason this is a cursed variant, and I know, I know some of you are going to tease me relentlessly for this, but I'm going to say it anyways, is that despite the advancements in puzzle typesetting of the last couple of decades, Parquet Sudoku is fundamentally not computer solver friendly. So many of us, including myself, do the majority of our setting and solving on a computer these days, and Parquet is so close to being viable to solve on screen, but given the current software, it's just far enough away from working perfectly that every time you have to solve one, you're reminded this puzzle is not in its natural habitat. I love pencil and paper solving, and I don't think we should discourage engaging with Sudoku variants just because they don't work well in a digital format. In my perfect world, we would all get better at pencil and paper solving and the typesetting software would also get better at supporting digital solving of unusual variants, and we'd all happily meet in the middle. But for now, every time I engage with Parquet Sudoku, there's just this little reminder in the back of my head of, this was not made to be engaged with on a computer like you're trying to approach it. So where did Parquet Sudoku come from? So while I was doing research on another variant for this video, I found a blog entry by Tom Collier, who is a British solver and setter from the 2007 World Sudoku Championship, where he mentions this variant. So I did a little more looking around, and sure enough, GM Puzzles came through with the info again. So according to GM Puzzles, this variant was first seen in international competition at the 2007 World Sudoku Championship, and quote, the unusual grids of tile Sudoku, which is what they've referred to it as, likely were created for other puzzle styles before being applied to Sudoku. Unfortunately, the existence of multiple puzzle types and games with parquet and or tile in their names makes it pretty challenging to find more information about the history of this variant. So if anybody can point to earlier puzzle types specifically that were given the parquet grid treatment, I'd be interested to see that. Let me know in the comments. Now, the second most cursed variant comes with a personal story. So I first got into competitive solving in 2021, so fairly recently. I had an okay year of competition in 2023, but for various reasons, I never quite fully pulled it together and lived up to what I feel my actual level of ability is that year. So when it came time to choose national teams for the World Sudoku Championship 2023, 
I was in this position where it definitely wasn't likely that I would end up on a US team. But there was just enough of a chance that I'd kind of barely make the cut for the C or D team that I was really, really, really motivated to do well on the US qualifying test. And so when the instruction booklet for the qualifying test was released, I felt pretty comfortable with everything in it as I was practicing. I was feeling fairly positive right up until I got to this. This is Weave Sudoku. It combines the cursedness of all three of the variants we've already looked at in this video into Clover's personal worst nightmare. It's even more visually overwhelming than greater than Sudoku. Just like in surplus and deficit, you can't use standard Sudoku rules because get this, there are no row and column restrictions in this variant. So digits can repeat in rows and columns as much as you'd like. And on top of that, it's obviously very difficult to typeset, which means practice puzzles for this variant are much rarer than they are for a variant that's regularly designed kind of casually on a computer. So the rules are this. So digits can't repeat in highlighted regions. And if you follow one of these woven lines in the background, sticking with the line that is the same thickness and the same shade, digits also can't repeat along those lines. So here we have an eight, a one, and a nine. So along the line I'm tracing right now, we can't have any more eights, ones, or nines. This variant may have gotten a higher ranking on my cursed list because I came down with COVID the day before the US qualifier. So I was sitting there in my garage with my puzzle printouts with a fever, like coughing, pouring snot out of every orifice and looking at this thing, thinking, is this what Sudoku is? Like, is this actually normal Sudoku and everything to date has been a lie? This variant was very memorable for me. I started looking into it for this video and I couldn't find anything online other than references to this qualifier and references to a single other puzzle from the 2010 World Sudoku Championship. By the way, the puzzle you're looking at on screen right now is the Weave Sudoku from the 2010 WSC, which is also the one that was used in the instruction booklet for the US qualifier. So in the interest of finding out more, I did the only thing I could think to do, and I contacted the person who wrote the qualifying test. Which, you remember Wei Hua Huang from the very first entry on this list, Surplus and Deficit? It was him. So luckily, he is a sweetheart, and he was happy to confirm to me that he was in fact the original inventor of Weave Sudoku. And he referred me to this fascinating book that I actually had heard of in the course of just learning about Sudoku history, but I had never gotten a hold of a copy for myself. It's called Sudoku Masterpieces by him and Thomas Snyder. Weave Sudoku was originally developed for that book in uh, 2009, I believe. And his goal with that book <clears throat> apparently was to really push the limits of variant Sudoku geometry, which looking at this, I would call that a success. The winner of my award for the most cursed Sudoku variant actually is not just one Sudoku variant, it is a whole family of them. And it's not what you might think based on what's on screen right now. So I'm going to lead up to it by introducing something that is not a cursed variant, which is pencil mark Sudoku, also known as Sukaku. So right now you're looking at a Sukaku that was set by my friend and colleague Bill Murphy. In this variant, instead of being given digits, you're given pencil marks, which tell you the options for certain cells. That lets you set up these exquisitely complicated classic Sudoku deductions in a really clean way. Because instead of having to restrict cells using digits, you can simply give the solver the necessary options for a cell right off the bat. And because of that, Pencil Mark Sudoku is generally one of my favorite variants, not cursed at all. And so, of course, Sudoku designers looked at it and said, well, how do we make this incredibly cursed? So the first example I'm personally aware of of the phenomenon I'm about to talk about is something called Pips Sudoku. So Pips as in dice Pips, the little marks on the side of a die to tell you what number you've rolled. So this variant was around as early as 2006 because this is the instruction booklet from the very first World Sudoku Championship in Italy in 2006. You're essentially being given pencil marks, but instead of being given pencil marks in digit terms, you're given the options from each cell in terms of partial dice Pips. So for example, this cell here. It has a dot in the very center, which means the only digits that can go here are ones whose dice pip representation has a dot in the center. 
And if we look at our handy key down here, that means it must be either one, three, or five. What you are given in this cell, in other words, corresponds exactly to being given a 135 pencil mark. That may be enough for you to start to understand why this variant was on the cursed list. But let me show you why it topped the cursed list. This is a Braille Sudoku from round two of the 2019 Sudoku Grand Prix. The round was authored by Jan Mrazowski, Lukas Buzkowski, and Piotr Godowski. This is not actual Braille Sudoku for blind solvers, which I discovered while researching for this video is a really cool thing that does actually exist. But this is not that. This is actually the same thing as Dice Pip Sudoku, except that now we can use the digits 1 through 9 by representing them in Braille, so we're no longer limited to the six sides of a die. But this is still just pencil mark Sudoku, but cursed. And it has become even more cursed because it's using a substitution system, Braille notation, that I would hazard a guess a much smaller percentage of Sudoku solvers are familiar with than the appearance of dice pips. Of course, you don't have to know Braille to solve this, the key is right there. But at the same time, every time you make things less familiar, you're adding one more layer of cognitive effort to the solve. But if you're still not impressed, I can make it way more cursed for you. So here is another riff on the same idea. And this one is called Roman numeral Sudoku. It is from round four of the 2015 Sudoku Grand Prix. When I was looking into this, I realized quite suddenly that this round was also authored by Jan Rosowski. Jan, are you okay? The reason I categorize this as even more cursed than Braille Sudoku is because we now have the added complexity of not knowing whether the missing part of the clue is meant to appear before or after what we're given. For example, if we have a V clue, it could just as easily be IV or VI. It's kind of like dice pip Sudoku, except instead of being given the exact locations of some dice pips, we're essentially just being told there are two dice pips horizontally next to each other, figure it out. Another example using letters instead of numbers is this substitution Sudoku, which is from round five of the 2019 Sudoku Grand Prix. This round was written by the team of Serbian authors, Nikola Zivanovic, Sedimir Milanovic, Zoran Tanisic, and Branko Serenic. Uh, this is actually pretty charming for aesthetic reasons, in my opinion, because it lets international authors bring words from their native language into a competition conducted entirely in English. The way it works, we can have a one represented by any of T, A, S, or I. So an F is exactly equivalent to, you guessed it, a four or seven pencil mark. It's another layer of cursedness on top of the pencil mark Sudoku that I secretly wish I was solving. There are various other examples of this idea out there in the world. Uh, for instance, this is Morse code Sudoku from the 2010 World Sudoku Championship, which tells you an unknown part of the Morse code representation of the number you're looking for. Um, this from the same contest is trinary Sudoku, where we have a partial trinary representation of the digit um, that you're trying to place in the, in the cell. Uh, same idea. However, it gets worse. <laughs> and here is where I give my actual official award for the most cursed Sudoku variant I uncovered while researching this video. And it is from the same championship that we're currently looking at the instruction booklet for. And it is called Inverse Digital Letter Sudoku. So first of all, we are not solving with numbers, we're solving with letters. We are not solving with normal letters, we're solving with representations of letters specifically as they would appear on an old-fashioned digital display. And unlike the other riffs on this variant where we're given partial digits and we have to add elements to it to make a full digit, we're being given all of the possible pieces we're allowed to use and we have to choose some subset of that that represents a valid digit. Which, by the way, does not actually change the logic of pencil mark Sudoku in any way. It just makes it more cursed. So, of course, I am going to back up my bullshit and attempt to solve this on camera. So this is a blind solve against my better judgment. I copied this into Penpa from the instruction booklet so I could solve it on the computer to make sharing it with you guys a little bit easier. Um, that said, I have not solved this or done any thinking about the logic so far, which was a relatively straightforward thing to do while I was copying it because this really looks pretty foreign to me and I have never solved anything that looked quite like this before. So uh, let's give it a try. I'm in Penpa. I'm using a uh, letter mode, which is already going to make things a little bit more complex. 
And so I guess the first thing I'm going to look for is things that look very empty where I don't have a lot of options for the components of the digits. Like this is really standing out to me. I'm pretty sure the only thing I could fit into this shape would be actually a C. Does that restrict where I can put? No, C can fit into almost any other shape, like except for A and F. So we'll have to leave that for now. Like C could go into any of those cells at this point. B is going to be the most restricted number to put in a cell, I think. Um, are there any rows or columns where I'm limited on where I'm allowed to put B? Bs can only go there, 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 or there. Or here, here, or here. Or here, 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 or here. Uh, yeah, there are too many options for B. Okay. So let's focus on just the cells that are not complete. Let's do that instead. And I feel kind of spoiled here by my solving software because obviously if I was doing this in an actual competition environment, I would not be able to do this kind of highlighting and this kind of rapid pencil marking that I'm going to be doing potentially. So to do this one, I need to have neither of the lines on the edge, which means that this can only be C, E, or F. This one has to not have a line on the bottom, so that is either A or F. And then this is also either A or F, because A and F are the only two that do not have that line on the bottom. So then these are B, C, D, and E. And of those, I believe that these have to be a C, E pair, because they don't have the two lines on the right. So now these are going to be a B, D pair. Okay, that's a start, although that doesn't resolve anything except for this C yet. So... What else looks promising here? I mean, F is pretty... Yeah, this actually has to just be F specifically, because the only other one without a bottom is A. Are there any other ones here that don't have that bottom line? Yeah, that's going to have to be an A. That's the only other one that doesn't have the bottom. Oh, and this one. So this is either an A or an F. Cool. So I have A and F there. I need to place an A into one of these cells. That is not really restricted at all. How about this one that's missing this kind of bottom right line? That's either C, E, or F, and it's not a C because we've placed a C already. This one missing the top right line can only be, again, C, E, or F, and it's not a C because we have placed a C already in the row. So yeah, that can only be E and F kind of missing that top right line, which makes this definitely an A and makes this a B, D pair. Okay, that's a start. We need to place an A into one of these cells. Oh, and one of these is, that that's actually already an F. I should have noticed that right away. So that's going to be an E. That's an F now. And then these are going to be some combo of A, B, and D. I'm a little wary of pencil marking those just because um, I'm worried about making this really visually confusing for myself. But YOLO. <laughs> um, what? Okay, so I'm seeing a few that don't have like a middle crossbar in them. And that eliminates A, B, E, and F, so that is either C or D. So that's going to be actually a C, D pair, making that an E, which makes that a C. And if that's a C, D pair, this is an A, B pair, and we have an A here, so that's a B and that's an A. Fantastic. This is also either C or D, because it's missing that middle crossbar. So that eliminates D here, which makes that a D. And that's now an A, B pair. This is going to have to be an E, so we can eliminate E from that cell. Okay, these are going to be B and E. This one's missing both of those on the right. So this is C, E, or F. That doesn't quite do it yet. And I'm absolutely sure that I'm missing something. Oh, this has got to be C or D as well. So that's D because there's a C already in the column. That makes that a B, makes that an A. Oh, that takes care of a ton of stuff for me. Fantastic. So that's not a B because there's a B in the region. So that's not an E. That's a B. These guys are going to be C, E, and F. This could be any of those. So that's C or F because there's an E in the column. So that's my E. So remaining in this region is now a D. And now we need A or F here with a C in that position. There's a B here. That's not a C, so this is a C-E pair. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop to discover that I broke it. We'll see. And these are going to be D and F. 
And I believe, <laughs> I hope, that that is inverse digital letter Sudoku. I will warn you, typically the instruction booklet puzzles, not always, but typically they are easier solves than the actual competition puzzles. They're meant to kind of introduce you to the logic and to answer any questions you might have about like edge cases and the rules before you actually do the puzzle in the contest. They're not meant to necessarily like train you to do the puzzle or to introduce you to like every possible nuance of the logic. So don't think that I would have done that well on um, on the actual puzzle in the contest necessarily. I did not check what its points value was, but I suspect it was probably harder. But really, th that was not that bad, which I suppose just goes to show that in the hands of a good setter, even a variant that is cursed, I, I mean, these variants all have their place. They don't exist for no reason. I mean, even the cursed pencil mark variants that I complained so bitterly about, they are interesting in certain contexts because, for instance, putting one in a contest gives you this really interesting way to specifically test people on their kind of adaptability and their ability to scan in a more general way and not just being hung up on scanning for numbers only. And I think that that's a really interesting skill to test people on, and I think that there's a place for that. Do I enjoy solving them? Not especially. Um, <laughs> I just end up confusing myself. But do I think that they should exist? Yeah, totally. And I would love to see kind of well-set and well-explored versions of, of all of these more frequently than I, than I already do. Um, yeah, hopefully this has been interesting for all of you. I imagine that some of these variants are ones that a lot of my community are not super familiar with, just because I know I am not primarily talking to people who are interested in Sudoku contests, and that's where a lot of the Sudoku community's history is held. So hopefully some of this was new to you, and if you want to pick a fight with me about my uh, opinions on which variants are cursed and which ones aren't, if you want to tell me that I left off your favorite cursed variant, hit me up in the comments, I don't mind. Maybe I'll make a number two um, top five cursed variants that my commenters told me about. Anyways, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day.